All right, hello everybody. We are going to get started. Um, so first, let us introduce ourselves. Um, I am Cutie Cat J9, otherwise known as Cat, or even further, known as Janine. Um, I am an admin here at Python Discord, as you are well aware. Um, and I'm also the events lead, so I help host events like this. Um, and I'll let Sebastian introduce himself. Oh, hello, my name is uh, Sebastian. Uh, I'm one of the owners here at Python Discord, uh, and I'm very glad to be in this event. Thank you, Janine, for inviting me. Um, in case you don't know, uh, Sebastian is a fantastic Python programmer um, and has also given presentations in the past about pattern matching. So we are all very lucky to have him here with us. So we are going to be doing an interactive session um, for pattern matching, which is Python's big upcoming 3.10 feature. Um, 3.10 is actually going to be released in on October 4th. Um, and as a bit of a sneak peek, we'll actually be doing an event for the release. So stay tuned for more details. That'll be coming in September. Um, but we hope that you have fun. Um, so Sebastian, can you tell us a bit more about what pattern matching is? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Um... Pattern matching is, is, is this very exciting new idea for Python, and, and it basically asks the question of um, if I have a specific kind of value and I want to match that value by its structure, and that sounds a bit weird, I know, uh, but that's why it's called structural pattern matching. Uh, and then, then the answer is, how can I do that? How can I, for instance, say I want to match a list with three elements, and the first element is this specific string called uh, um, attack. So it's like a command for a game. Um, so I want to match that very specific pattern, a list with three elements. The first element needs to be the string attack. The other two elements are unknown, but I want to know those elements. How can I do that in an easy manner? And structural pattern matching is, is the answer for that. You can now match those kind of values by their structure or their shape. Um, and that's what structural pattern matching is all about. It's a match case statement, uh, but that uh, but it doesn't just match by a single value, but it really starts looking at the shape of the object or the structure of the object. Um, if that's a little bit confusing, uh, conf confusing or weird for you, uh, we're going to uh, provide you with a few uh, examples today that will really highlight uh, why it's called structural pattern matching. Yep, um, here at Python Discord, we are strong believers that like doing the thing will help you learn the thing better. Um, so you can actually follow along with the code um, that Sebastian and I will be executing. Um, we will be posting it in the Patma code follow along, um, and you can feel free to tweak it and then post it in the 2.3.10 bot command channel. So you can sort of experiment with it live. Okay, so as you all know, there's a basic C style switch statement. Um, and for those, it's typically you're matching against a value. Um, let me give an example of it with pattern matching. Give me one second as I type this in the Patma code follow along. There'll be just a little bit of silence as we get this stuff um, posted. All right. Well, uh, um, Cutie Cat is typing out her command. Uh, let, let us give some context. Um, C is a, a fairly old programming language, and it has a very neat feature. It's a, it's a, it's a case statement. You can use it to match uh, literal values quite easily. Um, and that's something that you can also do with Python structural pattern matching. Although what we're going to see later is that uh, Python structural pattern matching is much more uh, than just matching those literal values. I was very nervous about this event last night and therefore did not get a lot of sleep. Um, so prepare to see a lot of um, quick troubleshooting in action. But as you can see here in the Patma code follow along, um, we have an example of um, what would be a basic C style switch statement. You have something you want to match and it matches to exact values. Um, it can only do values. As Sebastian mentioned, um, Python's pattern matching is so much more than a switch statement. Um, and that's why we're really excited about it. Yeah, so if you look at this um, simple match command, then you may think, well, I can do that with a simple if else statement or an if elif else statement just as well. I can just write if uh, command one uh, equals 42, and then I'll do the print there. 
Um, so if this was uh, all there is to it, uh, it probably would have never made it into Python in the first place. It was proposed in this form a few times in Python's history, uh, but it was always found to be redundant on top of the uh, regular if, alif, else statements we, we already have. And that's why this is not just all that there is to structural pattern matching. So um, we're going to start off with simple patterns and then work up to things that are more complex. So the first thing that is really cool is that we can match against the type of an object. So just off the bat, we can have different types of input. And instead of checking exactly what the value is, maybe we only care about the, the type it is. So maybe we care if it's a dict or a list or a string or an integer. Um, already pattern matching does more than the C style switch statements um, because we can we can check for, for types. Um, and for those who are maybe diving a bit down into the rabbit hole, yes, that means that we can match against classes, including custom classes. Um, but I will let Sebastian explain a bit more about um, how we can do um, if statements within uh, match cases. So uh, if you look at the match statement here, you can see that we're matching against a particular uh, characteristic of the value. So in this case, we're, we're matching against the type. Uh, and if you, you think very metaphysically, you could say that's a fundamental part of the shape of the object. This object is a string. Now we are talking Python here, uh, so this is all done with is instance checks in the background. So it also matches subclasses of that type. So it allows for duct typing. Uh, but what if we want to match against types that are an integer, but also have a very specific value, uh, like we want to check against uh, 42. Now in, in that case, something that we can do is we can add a guard clause to our uh, case line. Um, and that means that that guard clause is basically just an if condition and the and that case will only trigger if that if condition holds. So if we have a very simple match statement like we had here, something that we could do is something like this. Let me type it in real quick. Uh, so as you can see here, we've now matched against the, the case or the pattern that we've matched against is that it has to be a, a, a string, an instance of string but we've uh, added a guard clause into that, that the command one also has to be equal to the value of search uh, dungeon. So that guard clause uh, narrows down the case statement here, and you can add uh, any kind of uh, conditional statement that you want to do here, not only matching the exact value, because we can already do that obviously, but we could also have done if the length is equal to a certain length. And that works as well. So this is a guard uh, statement added to the case here. And as Janine or QDCAT says, uh, if it works in a normal if statement, it will work here as well. Yep. OK, so we're going to briefly pause because um, this is sort of laying the foundations of um, pattern matching. So if there are any questions now, um, I'd like to be sure that we, um, we answer them. Um, so we have a question for, or just a, a comment from LapFed, um, where it says the the syntax is a bit confusing. Um, so Sebastian, I believe I read in your presentation you had some great comments about how match case is essentially its own mini language. Can you expand on that? Yes, sure. So, um, and I have to. Uh, I think I can best use a quote from Larry Hastings here who is one of the, the, the core developers. And uh, what he said uh, a long time ago in a discussion about structural pattern matching is that I see the, st uh, the match statement as a domain-specific language contrived to look like Python and to be used inside of Python, but with very different semantics. So, um, and I think uh, uh, the word domain-specific language is really important here. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with his sentiments that therefore it should not be included in Python, but it is really a, a new mini language that you can learn and use in those case commands. Uh, and they can be arbitrarily complex. You can nest all kinds of patterns as we're going to see later as well. Uh, and it really is a, a fully new mini language that's being introduced in Python, a domain specific language to match objects by their uh, shape. Um, so yeah, it can be a bit confusing at first. On the other hand, 
Um, I had this same feeling when I started uh, out using structural pattern matching, but after a while you get used to it. It's not a very broad uh, new language. It had, I don't know how many patterns it has, something like 10 or 12. So it's manageable, but it's something that you have to learn in addition to Python, yes. Um, and I do see a couple of comments about how this will be just as confusing as rejects without being as useful. Um, so I think that you'll see it more useful as we get into the more complex patterns. Um, we're starting off with some fairly basic stuff that could easily be done with an if else or anything else, but you'll see just how awesome pattern matching gets. Um, so I'm going to showcase um, a little bit more code to illustrate the importance of the order of your statements. So in the code that I just posted, um, we're parsing three commands. Um, and you'll see that I check if it's a string, um, if I check if it's an integer and also 42, because I mean, 42 is the answer. Um, and then I check if it's just a general integer and then I remember it at the end, oh no, wait, I also wanna check for three. But you'll see in the output that even though it is an integer, and it is the number three, which is a more specific match, um, it isn't running the three is an okay number, I guess. Um, so this brings up an important point that the match case operates similarly to if else statements. It's going to evaluate the different cases. And then the first one that it fits, it's going to stop there. So what you want to do in general with pattern matching is put your most specific um, case at the top and then the more general ones at the bottom. So as it filters through, um, it'll hit the more specific ones, which you want to catch before. And then if, as it does not match, it'll hit the more general ones. So it actually follows a similar logic here to what you're already used to um, in Python. But of course, we also have some really cool things. Um, Sebastian, if you could, can we talk about the capture everything as well as the wildcard? Yes, sure. So um, in this case, you may want to have some kind of else condition. So uh, if none of my previous if previous cases uh, uh, were matched, can I have some kind of else case condition? And, and the answer is yes, you can do that. And there's a very special uh, pattern for that, and it's an underscore. So if you just use an underscore, then that case will always match the uh, the, the pattern. So if we have a pattern like this, um, then you can see that the, the underscore in the case here just meant then match whatever and don't do anything else. Um, so the, this underscore here really has a special meaning. It's a special pattern. And it's just like, we're always going to match whatever uh, we get here at this point. Uh, and there is uh, something interesting here. If you were to use such an underscore as your first case, then obviously none of your other case statements would ever get a chance to run because the first one would uh, already match uh, whatever you, you put into it. And luckily Python uh, does help you with that. It will check those kind of tautological conditions for you. And it will then just mention to you that having such a wild card uh, at, as the first case or as the non-last case will make the remaining patterns unreachable because that underscore will always match. So the second one will not even get a chance to, to be matched against. So this is something really interesting and this allows you to have um, a, a case that always runs if none of your specific cases matches. Uh, so if you're parsing something like an API response for which structural pattern matching is really great, you get something back that is totally unexpected, you can still handle that with the uh, with structural pattern matching. You can still have a, a default case that always runs. So Sebastian, I know that we can do something where we just um, do an everything capture group. Um, let me see if I can quickly illustrate that. In the meantime, there was a question by Delta. Uh, today I learned wildcards can be anything. A is also a valid wildcard. Am I right? Well, in a way you're right. Uh, what if you use the case A, so with an A instead of an underscore, what you're actually doing is you're, you have a named uh, a capture group or a name capture group and a name A 
uh, is being bound to whatever value you have there. And since there's no other condition in your pattern, that A will match anything. So whatever value gets to that case, A will be bound to it. And, and just as uh, an underscore matches uh, everything, such a named capture group will also match everything. Um, so yes, uh, it acts uh, similar, but it's not exactly the same because that underscore pattern really does not bind a name to the value as well. Um, you can see there that I illustrated the case between the differences between the underscore wildcard and then the um, default let's capture everything. So in the capture everything, as Sebastian mentioned, um, it still binds um, what we're looking for to a value and we can then use it. So maybe this is useful if you want to use a wrapper to find out what did slip past all of my match cases. Um, but otherwise, if you're just looking for a default case and you just need it just to make sense, you don't really care about the value, then the underscore makes sense. Um, but you can see there in my second code block that even though the commands look identical with the underscore, it does not bind um, the value to that underscore. So you can't do anything with that captured value as a variable. All right, so we're going to take a quick pause again um, and ask if there are any new questions about this. Um, if you're curious about why there is the underscore, um, reading through the Python enhancement proposal, the PEP, um, it's mostly just for having a good default case that you just need to capture everything, but you don't need the variable and just for it to look stylistically nice. Um, there are probably slightly more eloquent answers than that, um, but that's what I'm going to go with. Sebastian, do you have any more um, comments about the default capture everything group versus the wildcard? I don't really have any insights there. I think the difference between uh, uh, name binding and using an underscore really gets more important when you use this as sub patterns. So, uh, and that's something that we'll see later. Now we've only had one pattern in, a, in each case statement, but what the beautiful thing about structural pattern matching is that you can build up a more complex pattern that has several sub patterns. Uh, and there you sometimes do want to bind a name or sometimes you're not interested in that that uh, value at all. You just want to check whether or not, say, a certain attribute is there on an, on an object without care, actually caring about the value that attribute is assigned to. And then the underscore can really help you uh, make your, your uh, intent explicit by just saying, I don't really care about this value. I just want to match everything here at this point. All right, awesome. Um, so we are going to move on onto a couple of different more um, advanced patterns. Um, so the one thing that we're going to be looking at next is sequences. Um, so pattern matching does some pretty interesting things with sequences. I'm going to post a little bit of code um, and then uh, Sebastian and I will sort of go through it and explain exactly um, what's happening. So give me just a couple seconds. All right. Um, so the, in keeping with the spirit of PEP 636, the tutorial to pattern matching, um, we're going to be roughly assuming we're making um, a text-based um, role-playing game. Just super basic, go in a dungeon, kill some monsters, collect some treasure. Um, and the user is supposedly entering these commands. Um, so you can see in the first line there that I have the commands defined. These are commands that the user is entering sequentially. So we have search, attack dragon, and collect the 10 coins. Um, I have a quick for loop just to iterate through them. And then I also do something interesting here um, where I do a match item dot split. So I'm splitting each string on um, white space so that we actually have a list of different actions or different words in that phrase. And then I can also, based on that, with pattern matching, match it based on the length of the sequence. And if the sequence is a different length, we can do different things. And if you combine this with, say, an if pattern or type checking, you can see that it quickly, you can start making some complex patterns to find very specific match cases and very specific outcomes, which I think is very useful just in general in the parsing realm and beyond that. Um, I'll let Sebastian take over here and talk a bit more about the details. 
Yeah, so what's interesting here is that uh, we get different sequences here, and we're truly going to look for the, the, the structure or the general shape of the sequence. So when we split those, those commands, so search will be split in just a sequence with one uh, item in search, uh, which is a single action, and that's why we match the first case statement. Uh, do note that there's a comma after the action there just to make sure that we're matching a sequence. You can also surround it with uh, square brackets or just uh, parentheses if you like to make that uh, more explicit. But we're matching a sequence there that has exactly one element in it and we're binding the name action to whatever the value you have there is. So in this case, action will be bound to search and that's why we print you search. If you look at the second command, it's attack dragon. Uh, if we split that again with the item.split, we get a list of two elements, attack and dragon. Uh, and that's why the second case one, the one that uh, is looking for, specific, uh, for specifically two elements in a sequence, the action and the target will match there. And then we bind the names action and targets to attack and dragon uh, respectively. Uh, and this is really already a, a nice example of nesting uh, patterns uh, in each other because we've got a sequence match pattern, that's the outer one. And then within there, we have two uh, capture patterns to bind a name to the individual values. Um, that's what the action and the target are. And now we can print uh, you attack the dragon because we've uh, bound action to attack and targets to dragon. And it also works for uh, three elements. So if we do the collect 10 coins command and we split that again into uh, three different elements, then we can match that uh, and we can uh, bind the names action, amount and target to, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, respective values and then we can print you collect 10 coins um, and that this is really uh, all there is to it this will match any kind of uh, uh, sequence uh, except for strings bytes and uh, byte arrays so uh, using square brackets over uh, parentheses or or do, not using brackets at, at, at all does not really matter you're not matching specifically lists or uh, tuples here you're just matching any kind of sequence except those select three. Um, and you'll notice that for each case statement, I use a different way of specifying a sequence. Um, I use a list, I use a tuple. Um, all it's checking is the, the sequence, um, not necessarily the, the type when we do that kind of thing. So I purposely illustrated this to notice the difference. So now we've seen how we can do general pattern matching on sequence lengths. Um, but we can take this a bit further. We can match on a sequence and we can specify that a certain element in the sequence has to be a specific value. So let me show you. So you can see here that we have a couple of more things. We are now collecting things, but we can collect multiple things. We're attacking a dragon. And you can see there that now we're specifying for a specific case of or specifically, we have a specific, how many times can I say specific? Let's find out. Um, we have a very particular case for the word collect. And then after that, we still have the default just action target. So maybe we want to do something specific with the collect. Maybe we want to add something to the um, player's inventory. And we can only do that when they have the collect statement. So now we can specify that but we can still have just a generic action target. So you can see there how we go from more specific to general and how generally um, the pattern flows. But one thing I do want to notice is, does anyone notice an odd statement from the output? Something that doesn't quite make sense. Yes, attacking 10 coins. Um, so this is because we have something um, bound in a previous loop. And I will let Sebastian explain how things are evaluated and bound um, and how that can have unintended consequences. So uh, the odd thing here is that it says you attack 10 uh, coins, which is obviously a, a bit weird. So uh, why is this uh, happening here? So what's happening here is the fact that, so we, we search and we have the attack the dragon. Um, and so now we have, when we attack the dragon, that is pulling from the final case, the action target. So action is now bound to attack and target is bound to dragon. For the next loop, we do collect 10 coins. 
but you'll see here, it's going to match the, the second case, the collect amount target. But I made an error in this case on purpose. We don't use the word collect in the action, we're using the variable. And that's not bound in that statement because we're specifically looking for that value collect, which isn't bound to action. Action, the last time it was bound to anything was in the previous item when we did attack dragon. So you can see there that the variables being bound um, persist through the loops and beyond um, the scope of that case. So that is something to be mindful of. Um, I believe, Sebastian, in your presentation, you had an example of this, of as um, something was being evaluated, um, if it failed later on in trying to match the pattern, um, the first two variables would still be bound. Yes. Um, so you really have to be careful when you bind a name to something uh, that that name will be bound to it and uh, it will not go out of scope. It will just be bound to the value that you have. And that can be very useful. You can use it afterwards. Uh, but if you make a, make a mistake like here, you use the action in the, uh, in the F uh, string that we have there, uh, but we haven't actually bound anything new to it. You're just going to use whatever value that, would, that it was bound to uh, um, uh, when we were binding something. There's actually another trick, uh, trick thing that you need to uh, that you need to keep in mind. What if you only match a uh, a part of a of a certain pattern and you bind names uh, in in that one? Well, in that case, you may end up with something that's uh, that's a bit tricky. That it will bind the names as long as the pattern matches, and then once it fails, it will stop with uh, with matching that pattern. But that name will still be bound to that value. There's no undo in there. Uh, and so that may be a little bit surprising as well. And that's why a good recommendation is to just never use uh, those no names outside of the scope or rely on partial matching or anything. Just make sure you always bind the correct names and only use them there and then. Um, and for those wondering um, how you would go about this, um, this is a bit of a, a sneak peek to earlier, but I wanted to address this now since it was brought up. Um, if you still wanted to check for a specific value, but then bind that to a variable, this is how you would do that. Just like with various import statements, we can use the as name um, feature within Python. So we can do case collect as action. And now action is rebound to um, collect. So if you ever want to check for a specific value, but still bind it to a variable to reduce having to use the same like the same specific value over and over this is how you would do that so quite i when i saw this feature i thought it was really quite nice um, and you'll see that this is going to be really nice when we look into um or patterns within pattern matching so the one thing that is really cool um that i think i'll let sebastian take over is using um the args keyword, um, star args. So we can use that within pattern matching and we can do quite a few neat things as well. So uh, say that we're, uh, say that we have a game and we want to uh, allow the user to say, um, grab and then all of these items. And it doesn't really matter how many there are. We just want to match the, the grab keyword and then pack all the items they specify in a long, a list um, as the items that the player is going to grab. So is there something uh, we can do there? And in reality, yes, there is. So if we have a command like grab um, coins and uh, grab a sword and maybe a shield as well, then we can match the commands and have a case statement that just collects all items into a single list and then we can use that list to say what happened in something like this and as you can see uh, we now have a sequence pattern here uh, we we're looking for the first element that needs to be equal to grab and then how many uh, elements are off after it we don't really care we're all going to uh, collect them into this uh, uh, we are, we're going to pack this into the single list and we're going to bind the name items to it. 
And so now I now I can allow the user to specify an arbitrary number of uh, items that they want to collect, and then I can just bind it to it. In this case, match statement will work. Is that a little bit like you had in mind, Janine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one thing that I think would be really neat to bring about, and this is something that I learned um, through your presentation, is that even with um, the star args, we can still do like a first and last within those args, which I found just really super neat. So uh, what you mean to say is, for instance, that you may want to do something like this. Let me just quickly make a uh, my example here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the user to sell something to the bank or to an enemy and as we can see here, uh, now I have the items, the star items part in the middle of the sequence, and we're really matching if the first element is cell and the last element here is bank or enemy, and we sell the items to uh, whatever target uh, um, matches the last element here. Um, and this is something that's, that's really awesome. You can really make uh, more complex patterns here. Now, obviously you need to uh, uh, be a bit careful with this. You cannot just use this in multiple points in your uh, sequence. That will be that would become very difficult to parse. So, uh, but it is really cool that you you don't have to use it as the last element. You can also use it as a first or as a middle element. That star pattern. So even though that's not specific to pattern matching, I just thought it was super neat and will be even more helpful in constructing um, these patterns. Yes. So you may notice from a regular packing as well, you can do this uh, when, you, when you, you assign to such a packing pattern as well. So I believe now it is time that we look at um, or patterns within pattern matching. So you can actually, if you want to check for, for instance, um, in that case, uh, in Sebastian's case where it's cell, coins, sword, shield, enemy, maybe cell could also be by, um, or like give other similar verbs. And you don't want to have that many pattern matching statements checking for just like one small difference. So instead we can use an or pattern matching. So you can see there that we can do sell or give. Um, in this case, I'd like to stress earlier that um, pattern matching is a little bit like its own mini language. So it has a little bit different syntax. Um, in this case, I think it's beneficial because it'll make it more clear um, what's happening um, within the match case. So you have to use the, the vertical pipe, um, which you may find common as an or statement in other languages. Um, but here it'll check for either sell or give. And this is very useful for checking different situations, but not having to have many, many match statements. <laughs> That's all right, Sebastian. If you'd like to comment now, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I think your patterns are uh, uh, are really, really um, powerful. You can uh, make uh, quite a few uh, 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 more difficult parsing jobs uh, easier if you if you can do something like this. So uh, I've actually played around with this, and one of the things that I've used structural pattern matching for is matching uh, API responses. They're typically fairly uh, well documented. You you typically get something like a JSON response back, and then you parse that, and you get a Python dictionary with often nested structures and and something like that. And then using this OR pattern can really cut down on the number of checks that you have to do, or uh, uh, the number of complex conditions that you need to have. You can really make a pattern that matches the specific structure that you're looking for uh, and has something like an OR embedded within that. And I think that's really neat. And that I think that's really something that uh, makes structural pattern matching shine. And this is also where the, um, the as name feature in Python um, comes super in handy because if you're checking for many different values and you want to use that value later in code, um, you can then bind it to a name like this. So in the case of an RPG, if you, if you want the player to be able to specify any direction to go and then execute code like player dot move and then in parentheses direction, um, you can now do that within the code because you're binding the direction um, to the name direction and you can use that. So this is where I think or patterns really shine is when you can also bind it to a specific name to use later in the code. Yeah, this is really something that, that I'm looking forward to using. It can really simplify uh, uh, some of the things that you're doing, especially if you're parsing more complex structures. 
Uh, I do want to caution people a little bit because it's really cool and it's really exciting that, you, that you're able to use something like this. Uh, if you have a very simple situation, then it may just be better to use a regular if else uh, construction because that's uh, uh, really clear. But for the more complex parsing jobs, structural pattern matching can really simplify your code logic. So Janine, where, where do you want to go next? Um, I figure now we can just take a quick break um, and see if anybody has any questions that we can answer. Just as a reminder, even with this complex statements, we can still add if statements. So don't forget that like these patterns can get even more complex, um, but complexity is not always a beneficial thing. So just keep that in mind as Sebastian said. <laughs> no, no. Some situations are inherently complex, so your code may be complex, but it should not really be difficult or really difficult to understand or follow. So um, I, I always try to write code that's as easy to understand as possible. I'd like to avoid unnecessary complexity. And that just that's not just something for uh, pattern matching, but for a lot more as well. So I see a few uh, other questions here in the chat, and some have to do with uh, where these kind of patterns are valid. So where can you use that pipe character um, to, to uh, use that? And, and the answer really is it's really specific to these structural pattern matching patterns. It truly is a, like a mini language that uh, was designed specifically for pattern matching. And all these patterns here are very specific to uh, a structural pattern matching. It's really a, a, like Larry Hastings says, a domain specific language for structural pattern matching. And it looks a bit like regular Python, but it, actu but it actually does something different, something different than what you're used to. I think that's really important to stress. And we also have a question from LapFed. Um, the first question being, is this mini language tearing complete? Um, <laughs> no question. It's part of Python, um, but it on its uh, like it's still part of Python, just has its own special syntax. Um, it is very akin to like the string mini formatting language. So not really a programming language on its own, but just sort of a subset of Python that has slightly different rules that you need to obey. And we also have the second question from LabFed, which is, can we use something like variables or function calls? Um, yes, yes, you can. You can check if um, the case is equal to a specific um, function call, actually. Um, I believe the tutorial pep goes, 636, goes through this in the case of like using, capturing events or seeing if a button click um, matches a specific event. So you can actually do that. I really recommend going through um, PEP 636. Uh, this presentation is purposely a little bit different from that, so you can also go through that um, and check it out. And yes, LabFed, you can also do that. You can check it against a specific variable. So we have a question from Panda Weir. Uh, will pattern matching be faster than if statements regarding speed? Um, so that I am not sure about. I would have to do just a little bit more um, researching into that. Although I do believe we actually have a CPython core dev in chat. Hello, thank you for joining us. Maybe he knows the answer. But otherwise, I will get back to you on that. I will do my best. Oh, yep, already answered above. Thank you, Brant. And very happy to have you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Brant Butcher, the very lovely purple name in chat, is actually the author of PEP634, um, what we're talking about now. This is really exciting. It's like having a mini celebrity in chat. Also terrifying. OK, I think those are most of the questions answered. Um, so we're going to, so far we've just taken a look at sequences. Um, let's take a look at some other types of data structures. For instance, let's take a look at dictionaries. Um, Sebastian, would you like to take this part? Because I just shamelessly copied your code. <laughs> so uh, let me just take a look at, at the dic dictionaries that we, uh, uh, that we have. So let's say that we have a dictionary and that we want to match that dictionary based on uh, um, on its structure. Well, that's something that we can do, but there's something odd going on here. And that is that when you match a dictionary, you're not actually, uh, um, that the syntax that you're using is going to 
is going to look like uh, something like this. Let me just copy paste an example here, then we can look at the example. So um, uh, here what we have is we have a few dictionaries here in the list and we're going to iterate over that list and then we're going to match each dictionary. So that's just so we have a few more examples. Um, and if you look at the first one is uh, you see a case class Jedi. Uh, and this almost looks like a complete dictionary. So you may expect that we're going to match the dictionary against this entire dictionary and that, that they have to match specifically. Uh, but that's actually not the case. Uh, what this only says is that the dictionary should have a key called class and that key uh, has to be assigned to uh, the value Jedi. And that's the only thing that the first case statement is going to look for. So if there are other keys in the dictionary, that's okay. Uh, uh, that doesn't really matter. If this is the only key value pair in a dictionary that also matches, that is also not an issue. So instead of this being the literal dictionary that we're matching against, it just says the dictionary that's going to match this at least, at least needs to have the, the key class and the value Jedi. Now, and in the second one, uh, uh, this is going to match any dictionary that has a key class that is bound to a value wizard and then also has a key called name, and then we're going to bind the name name to whatever the value uh, name is uh, assigned to in a dictionary. And that's what's happening here as well. So if you look at the first output, I hope it isn't uh, a rinse the wind. Now, if we look here at the second dictionary in our list, then the name is rinse the wind and the class is wizard. And that is specifically what that second case pattern matches. There is a key called class. It's assigned to a value called wizard. It has a name key. And so we can bind the name name to whatever that value uh, was assigned to the name key in this call, in this case, uh, rinse the wind. And then we have two dictionaries for Jedi's. They both have class Jedi, and it doesn't really matter that there's also a key value pair name is Luke or Yoda, because uh, we're not doing an exact match. We're just looking for any dictionary that has a class a key and a, a Jedi as the value for that key. So that's why it matches both the Luke and the Yoda a dictionary, and that's why those two print as well. Now, if you look at the very first one, why isn't that one matched? We have a class warrior and the name hero. Uh, oh, sorry, that's the class warrior. I, I cannot read life. Um, it's not wizard. So there's actually no case statement that matches a class of the warrior. So you can see that the first dictionary doesn't match anything at all. And that's why there's no print for that one there. So this is basically how matching with uh, uh, dictionaries work. Uh, you don't specify the exact dictionary, but rather what kind of uh, attributes or sorry keys you're looking for in the dictionary, potentially matched with another pattern for the value. It could be a literal like Jedi, or it can be a, a capture pattern like name, like we have in the second case to bind a name to it. It can even be a wildcard pattern so uh, that you can say name has to be uh, uh, present as a key, but I don't really care about the value that it's bound to. I don't care about that. That's another option that you could use. Um, so you can use any other pattern for the value as well. Yeah, so I had a lot of fun with dictionaries in my experimentation. Um, you'll see that this sort of pattern matching is fairly simplistic. Um, this is done on purpose. I encourage you to experiment with it. Um, I think hash maps are incredibly powerful and you can do a lot of interesting things with matching parts of a dictionary and doing things with it. So highly recommend you experiment with it. And now I'd like to take a look at classes, um, specifically custom classes. So if we match against a class, it is the same as doing an is instance. And let me show you. So you can see there we have three classes. We have a wizard class and a Jedi class. And we also have Sith, which is a subclass of the Jedi class. We make four heroes um, for each of them. We have Rhineswind, Yoda, Luke, and also Darth Maul. Um, so for each of these heroes, we're going to see if they're a wizard or a Jedi. But you'll see there that if I match Jedi, because Sith is subclassed on Jedi, it'll still match there. Um, so this is also very powerful. As you can see, these are custom classes. Um, so for previous questions asked on, can you match against custom data types or data structures? Yes. Um, if you're trying to match against the equal sign, make sure that you implement your own um, equality and less than dunder 
for here, it's going to use the same thing as is instance. Um, so this is pretty cool. Sebastian, do you have any comments? Well, uh, just a small typo. Uh, your second pattern is, is currently a oh, yep. uh, capturing pattern. There should be a parentheses in there, but it will work the same. Thank you. So uh, just to highlight the differences for those who are uh, following along, if you don't use the parentheses at the end, you're not doing an is instance check, but you're using a capture pattern and you'll just assign Jedi to whatever comes in. And in this case, we're truly looking for the type Jedi, which is what we want. So in structural pattern matching, those parentheses are really important. They don't actually instantiate the class. They don't call the uh, initializer of the class, but this is just a pattern to say, I want to match against the type with an is instance check. So yeah, it's it, this is really cool. Um, and what what may, may be slightly uh, difficult, which takes some getting used to, is maybe the, the binding of the name there. If you look at the first case, there's a wizard and the name is captured name. So what this means is that we're looking for a name attribute on the wizard instance. And then we bind the name captured name to whatever value that attribute has. Uh, and this may look a little bit weird if you uh, see this for the first time, because uh, we're actually binding something to captured name and not to name. While well, you may be used to seeing captured name is something to bind something to captured name. But the reason for that is that we're really matching an attribute. And then we're saying wizard with a name attribute is equal to some kind of structural pattern matching pattern. And in this case, it's a capture name or a capture pattern, but it could also have been a wild card, which just says the name attribute has to be present. We're not going to capture it. Or it could be a, a literal, I only want to match the specific wizard Rinsewald. So the name attribute has to be Rinsewald specifically. Uh, so in the in the place of captured name there, you can use any pattern that you want to use to match against that attribute name. And this is really the beauty of pattern matching. You can nest those patterns uh, for more powerful matching. And uh, a good remark, there are a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> horribly creative hacks possible here with uh, the instance check uh, done there that you can have. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> bit terrified um, by what esoteric Python will do with this. Um, um, and yeah. yes, pattern matching can also check against properties of classes. Okay, so we are just about hitting the one hour mark. Um, so we're going to take a couple more questions um, if people have them now, and then we'll go through a couple of more code items that we can't actually review in Snackbox um, because it requires like, it requires Pygame essentially or other sort of um, game. Uh, frameworks, but we'll still kind of go through it to illustrate what it does. Um, and then we'll sort of wind down. Um, these channels will still be hanging around. Don't worry. This Python 3.10 bot is probably going to hang around for a while, um, just because it's really fun to see 3.10 live, especially pattern matching. So any questions that we can answer for the time being? But I will say I do highly encourage people just to start experimenting with it and to also read um, all three um, Python enhancement proposals with it. Um, the proposals are a bit on the long side, but they are incredibly well written. Um, very easy to read, makes sense, walks you through everything. Um, highly recommend reading through it to understand both the rationale behind it, how the language was constructed. Um, PEP 634 is very well written. Um, and all of that fun stuff. So the PEPs are 634, 635, and 636. If you check in our announcements channel, um, I linked them. You have to scroll up above the uh, Pi uh, Week announcement. You can also use our pep command. We have that. That's a thing. So someone was asking about, is there a special dunder for pattern matching? Well, there actually is one, but it's, it's a little bit obscure. It's for classes. If you, uh, uh, so if you want to match against a class, uh, then obviously you either have to do that with keyword arguments, but you can also use positional arguments. And that's a little bit different because then you need to know the uh, uh, order in which you're matching. Uh, and then you have a very special dunder and it's called uh, match arcs and you can set it on your class. And it will tell you, uh, it will tell Python uh, uh, what the uh, uh, match arcs is that you match against. It's explained in the class patterns part of the PEP. I can probably link it because it's a bit difficult to explain here. Yep, and if you really want to like get 
down and dirty into the internals and see exactly what you can do. Again, I can't stress enough how much I, re I recommend reading through PEP 634. Um, very well written, and it makes a good argument for how powerful pattern matching is. Oh, and I'm already seeing uh, cursed uh, <laughs> examples. Yeah, that's... Uh... Oh no, it's starting. <laughs> what have we unleashed? Oh, we didn't do anything. We did not introduce this feature. <laughs> okay, um, so let's go through some example code. Um, this is <laughs> being ripped straight out of PEP 636. I literally did a control C, control V, um, so I won't be evaling this. So you can see there sort of what why pattern matching could be useful in, say, a basic RPG game. Um, we can match an event dot get so rather than having different checks and calling different functions we can just do a match case so you can check against the key press or if it's quit we can check for different key names um, if it's another key press we're like ah we don't care if they're pressing the, the escape key that's who cares they're not escaping from this game and if there's another event and here you can see like that um, catch-all pattern we can raise a value error we're like hey we don't know what this is. It's not a key press and it's not a click. What did the user do? So you can see there how it can really start to build um, powerful patterns. Okay, and we have quite an interesting match case there um, from Panly that sort of, yes, pattern matching as you get into more complex use cases, you can definitely make it easier to interact with classes and do very specific things. Um, I know for my own work, I sort of made like a little, we have a lot of different instruments that we use to measure um, like weather and flow rate in this whole test setup. Um, and I wanted to make this as simple as possible for the operator. So they would type simple commands like um, set up X, set up Y. X and Y were totally different machines. So I needed them to do different things. And all, both of them could have like different arguments after. Um, pattern matching would make this so much easier to both read. I think it makes it a lot simpler to read overall. Um, it just makes it a really nice feature to the language. Um, prepping for this talk had me really excited because I really got to dig into pattern matching. Um, and this is why I will always support correcting people when they say it's a switch statement. It is so much more than that. Any final comments, Sebastian? Any final comments? Uh, I, I just uh, I just have some comments in general about structural pattern matching. If that's uh, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, your final thoughts as we sort of wind down this event since we are over the one hour mark. Ah, cool. So um, I'm really excited about structural pattern matching. I think I'm going to use it uh, sparingly in situations where it's really uh, going to simplify something that I need to do. Um, I'm not going to overuse it, I think. Uh, I think in a lot of situations, regular if, elif, else statements already cover most of what I do. So there's no need for structural pattern matching there. Um, but I think structural pattern matching will be uh, something that may really help with those nested structures. So you're, you're kind of parsing something like a, a nested dictionary, for instance, if you're parsing an API response or you're working with classes and you're, you're doing stuff with that. Um, so uh, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to being in a situation where I can use it. Um, although I think, and I think this holds for everyone, we just need to get used to it as well. It's currently not a solution that I will think about because just because I'm used to using other techniques in Python. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll see some very uh, innovative, I have to say, uses in the future that I can learn from because I'm sure there are some really innovative uses for it. And I think, uh, I, I, I hope that everyone has an open mind uh, in learning it, because I think it is going to be, uh, be beautiful. And I think that's about it. I'm really excited about it. I, I'd like to thank all the, the core developers and everyone involved in doing it, uh, in working on this uh, idea sometime, for some four years with a lot of discussions. Discussions are, are obviously a natural part of a language as Python, and I'm really happy with the current implementation. Thanks to everyone, all the core developers and everyone else involved, all the volunteers and developers and contribu uh, contributors uh, uh, to the feature. Yep, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, and this is a gorgeous feature, super exciting. Um, 
And again, reminder, we will be doing a fun event for the 310 release. Um, and we will also, um, we'll keep around this 310 um, Python eval bot around. So if you want to keep playing with it and you don't want to try to build your own um, 310 release candidate one build, just hang out here um, and eval it away. Uh, and we'll also hang around after the fact for a couple of questions. But otherwise, this is the end of the event. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is being recorded um, and we will be sharing this later if you'd like to listen back to it. Um, so thank you. Yes, and thank you, Janine, for setting it up. All right, and now I have to remember how to end the stage channel.